You know how this works? Um, nothing is happening. Okay, looks like we're ready. Now, I'd like to begin <coughs> with a, something that that I was thinking of last night during um, uh, Sven's talk. Now, some of us have been doing geology research most of our careers, um, trying to understand the relationship between uh, geology and the Bible. So why do we do this? To convince us that the Bible is reliable? Well, no, that's not why I do it. Um, I've always been confident that the Bible story is correct. So why did we do this? Well, <clears throat> science claims that it has proved the Bible wrong. And some of us are very tired of seeing friends give up on the Bible and on Jesus because, they, because science tells them the Bible is wrong. This is very, very uh, painful to see this happen. This is why we do this research. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus gave a little uh, rebuke to, to doubting Thomas. But he didn't stop there. He gave him evidence. He cares about Thomas, about people who are struggling to understand how to put this all together. And uh, <clears throat> we're tired of seeing friends get discouraged because of what science tells them. Because science has not disproved the Bible. And the more we study, uh, do research, the more we can see that that's true. So, let's see, I still don't know how to make this work. Um, <laughs> I pushed the arrow. Oh, okay, it worked. I hope it continues working. Okay, uniformitarianism. That's this belief that, that geology, geological processes, all this stuff goes very, very slowly over long ages of time. Uh, not not rapidly. Catastrophism is the belief in catastrophes. Things can happen very rapidly, catastrophically. So geologists were originally catastrophists. Why did it shift to to uniformitarianism? Was that the re inevitable result of new evidence showing the Bible is wrong, uh, or were there other important factors? That's what I'm uh, going to be talking about. Um, works now. Okay. It was a very long and complicated process and I can only rather briefly uh, summarize the essential nature of that uh, transformation. Um, geology was strongly influenced by the surrounding culture and personal choices. This will be an important factor here. Personal choices. <clears throat> okay. Early geological thought. In the centuries after Jesus, you didn't go to a university and get a PhD in geology. Hardly anything was known about geology. It took quite some time for, for awareness of what was going on in geology to come about. Uh, what were fossils? That was not understood. They were thought to be what was called sports of nature, um, various odd things. Uh, and it took time for the realization to come about that these are really the remains of once things that were once alive. And then why and how are they preserved? Well, to these uh, geologists, the flood, they were believers in the flood, these earlier geologists. And to, flood to them was the only feasible explanation um, for fossils. And we'll talk about that more later. Um, okay, catastrophes are long, slow processes. Catast catastrophic theories were the prominent geological interpretation early on into the 19th century, so into the 1800s. Uh, geologists generally believed that catastrophes were what produced the geological record. Uh, and until a few centuries ago, scholars generally accepted the, the biblical account, including geologists. Now this began to change, especially in the 18th century enlightenment. So our topic is, uh, why, why did this change? Um, <clears throat> And what happened during that time is the introduction of philosophies not compatible with the Bible. 
um, not, not believing the Bible anymore. So over time, society gradually kind of diverged, uh, not sharply, but diverged into two main groups. Some uh, believe the Bible is not an authoritative book. There was, a, there was a move to generally discard any authority, including the Bible. But others were faithful Bible believers. And this same trend uh, was among geologists. Some accepted the literal biblical creation and flood, and that was part of their geological explanation. Others went to a more materialistic or naturalistic theory. And again, our question really is, why did this happen? New evidence? Well... The geology, in geology, most of the geologists, as this movement began, were still catastrophists. They believed uh, in the flood, the catastrophe of the flood. Um, some, some accepted, actually, the literal biblical creation flood. Others, not necessarily, but they saw the evidence in the rocks for catastrophe. The rocks just gave evidence that they were formed catastrophically. And to these people, the, the catastrophic events, or these are some words that they, you find commonly used by them, violent, sudden, ruinous, unexpected, widespread, and continental at least. <clears throat> okay, in geology, those who moved away from the, from the Bible um, began to think of rock formations formed by natural agencies. This was the uniformitarianism. Rocks formed smoothly, ceaselessly, locally, slowly, and gradually, the uniformitarians, and this didn't come about all of a sudden. We're going to talk about uh, the process. Okay, some of the reasons why these things happen. And this is one that I, that I think uh, the Reformation encouraged people to think for themselves. That clearly is true. It encouraged them to, to study the Bible and not just take what the church taught them. Now, if somebody didn't want to believe the Bible, I have a suspicion this would influence their thinking in other ways, to, to think for themselves in other ways than what they had, had thought before. And in the 18th century, some, some movements in geology, uh, people are always aware of earthquakes and volcanoes, but they begin to be more thought of what is this all about and what is happening. And that affected the understanding of geology. And so it, became, it was evident that uh, geological processes were more complex than previously thought. And I have a big asterisk here because I think this is a, a very important one. There was a shift in philosophical thought away from the Bible by choice. They chose to move that way. Um, <clears throat> choices to move away from confidence in the Bible. Uh, they, they didn't make this choice because of new geological evidence that said the Bible was wrong. The geologists were basically catastrophists. That's what they saw in the evidence. Uh, but so things that happened, it wasn't necessarily just an arbitrary change. Uh, some of my friends at the seminary have helped me to understand this. Um, there, were, there were things that, that weakened confidence in the Bible, confidence in religion in general. Um, during the Reformation, there was fragmentation of Christian thinking. You got the Catholics, you got these different reform groups, they all thought differently and argued with each other. And they, they didn't continue to study the Bible to understand why they were thinking differently. But they different and argued. And it actually resulted in religious wars, the Thirty Years' War and the English Civil War. So the, these, these things wore down confidence in, in religion. So the change was not from evidence the Bible was wrong. From people behaving badly. Uh, not thinking carefully, not, not really studying the Bible to understand why they were, they were differing. And, and then the differences resulted in wars, religious wars, fighting over about this. <clears throat> so now during, and during the time that these changes were occurring, there really was not available evidence in biology and geology for, for solid understanding. And so the changes didn't lead to solid new understandings. They, they changed, but they didn't really have a good basis. When, when Darwin was studying and coming up with this theory, their, their biological understanding was, you, you could have to say, was primitive in many ways. They didn't know. Any, they knew nothing about molecular biology, or what was going on in the cell, and in many other ways. <clears throat> they were, were very racist. They thought um, 
generally the dark-skinned races were har hardly above the apes. That, that's pretty sad, but that was the, the status of scholars there in England. Um, <clears throat> so the result was this shift toward human reason rather than trust in the Bible. Okay, catastrophist geology. Let's talk about this specifically. The, these, uh, before about 1830, most geologists were catastrophists. The rocks were formed catastrophically. Some because of belief in the Bible, others just saw evidence in the rocks for catastrophe. Um, and the early ge development of the, these geological uh, thinking processes was in, in England. That's where geology began. And there's, uh, historians describe several groups of these early geologists. And I don't think these were sort of distinctly different groups. Um, there were individuals changing their thinking as time went on. But anyway, they describe uh, three groups. The, the early catastrophes, Noah's flood was the only event since creation capable of making significant geological change. Still very much believers in uh, the flood. So some geologists, Thomas Burnett, John Woodward, William Whiston, Alexander Cutcock. I'll give you a quiz on this at the end. Um, okay, then the, the, another group called English Deluvialists. Deluvia, of course, meaning flood. Adam Sedgwick, Daniel Conybeare. Um, they believed in a, in a succession of catastrophes. So not just Noah's flood, but a succession of catastrophes with Noah's flood probably being the last one. And then a group called scriptural geologists, early in the 19th century, Buckland in part, Cedric, Conybeare, etc., Murchison. They followed the Bible. Most of these people were still believing in the Bible. Uh, but they allowed, this group allowed more variation in geological processes, not only Noah's flood. For many of these, the catastrophes were usually global or at least continental. So their thinking is still in a large scale, cha large scale changes. <clears throat> Um, one thing that gradually began to change from about 1750 to 1830, there was a gradual change thinking that Noah's flood was not caused supernaturally. Uh, it, it, was, it had some other factors involved here. Now, there were two very prominent leaders in, in this shift away from catastrophism, from biblical geology. The first one was James Hutton. And he wrote a book, Theories, Theory of the Earth. And this was a completely uniformitarian theory. He used a phrase, no, no sight of a beginning, no prospect of an end, things happening over long ages of time. And he, th he still thought God was involved. God used geology to accomplish his will. But it was a uniformitarian process, not, not catastrophic. catastrophic. Um, he was not a good writer at <clears throat> excuse me, and had relatively little influence. But then came along Charles Lyell in the, in the 1800s. Um, he wrote a book, Principles of Geology. Um, this was a further development of, of uniformitarian uh, theory. Now, Lyell was different from Hutton in the sense he was, a, he, was a good, he was a lawyer, okay, not primarily a geologist, perhaps. He was a lawyer, very skilled at arguing his case, and a good writer, so he was much more influential. Now, one factor that actually is, is a positive thing, we could say that with, with Lyell's book was the beginning of geology as an organized science. But that's, uh, other things we can say are not so complimentary. Um, <clears throat> there was a mixed reaction to these new uniformitarian ideas. Uh, some supported them, others uh, responded with sarcasm, uh, laughed at them. The, this, there was laughter about this, what they called the piddling school of geology. And that phrase came from a, a, a cartoon somebody drew of a, a very broad valley, a little boy urinating in that valley. The implication was this little stream of water carved that whole valley, which is really what the uniformitarians were saying. And so uh, Murchison got a lot of mer uh, merriment out of that and others, <clears throat> but in time, Uniformitarianism overcame the opposition. Some more on Lyell. Um, Lyell was, like I say, a skilled writer and thinker, but his uniformitarian th theory did not come from the geologic thinking of the day. He didn't look at what other geologists understood, what they were thinking, and then put it together into his theory. He didn't, the others were catastrophists. He did not like catastrophism. 
And he, he developed his own theory, his uniformitarian theory, uh, to combat this catastrophism. Um, he chose to go away from that, even though the evidence did not favor Lyell. Uh, and he essentially banned catastrophic thinking for, for, from geology. He had a strong influence on Charles Darwin. Darwin read his book, and that gave Darwin the long ages he needed to make his theory look uh, realistic. I say make it look realistic. Okay, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, some of you I'm sure would know, know him. He, he's dead now, but for, for several decades, he was one of the more prominent uh, paleontologists and evolutionists, uh, professor at Harvard, but he was a careful thinker and an honest man. And he said things sometimes that his colleagues didn't like because he was very honest. He, he's, he um, carefully analyzed Lyell's work and he, even though he, uh, Gould did not like the biblical story of, of origins, he saw weaknesses in Lyell's work. And uh, Lyell took a, a culturally derived concept of gradual change and imposed it on geology. He didn't get his uniformitarianism from the evidence. He just preferred that. He developed his own uniformitarian theory, even though the evidence favored catastrophism. And uh, uh, Gould says the catastrophists were better observers than Lyell. They understood the evidence said catastrophe. Lyell didn't like that, and he went a different direction. And one of uh, Gould's comments is Lyell won with rhetoric but he could not carry with data. A good, a good arguer, <clears throat> even though he's not a good observer of geology. Okay, so uh, the movement away from the Bible toward uniformitarian geology resulted from what? Human error, the way that people argued about religion, inadequate information, <clears throat> and especially a choice. They chose to, de to rely on human wisdom, not on the Bible. And so during, through time, those choices have hardened now into a very firm scholarly denial of the Bible and preference for, for our own thinking and a very uh, antagonism toward anybody who, who doesn't agree with them on this, which I've had to deal with in publishing papers many times. Okay, let me give you an illustration. <clears throat> geological illustration of what these two theories mean. Okay, this is a photograph from a place called Canyonlands National Park in Utah. This is a gigantic canyon. Uh, the top of the canyon is right here. The bottom of the canyon is this river, the Green River, which goes from Wyoming down and joins the Colorado River and then on down to California, past where I live and to the ocean. <clears throat> okay, how did this all, all happen? And we'll um, discuss it in two steps. You know, first, how did you deposit all this rock? And then how did you erode the canyon? So this, this is a canyon. At one time, these layers of rock you see here once filled the entire valley. There was no canyon. That was all rock like this with, with more on top of this. Okay, so how did you deposit that rock? How did it get there? Well, the two theories, the catastrophist theory says um, there was a, a gigantic, there had to be a gigantic flow, a gigantic flood of water from, from Wyoming and Colorado and places beyond through this area, rapidly depositing this rock. All these, this is all very uniform layers of rock that go for hundreds of miles. Uh, that was all deposited by a catastrophic process. The other theory, Uniformitarian says no, um, this river that you hear, see here carved all of this. For millions of years, it gradually wandered back and forth and gradually cut out this sediment, carried it on down to California. Okay, that's the two theories for depositing the rock. And now once you have the rock there, now you have to cut the canyon. So the catastrophic theory is you eroded it catastrophically. There was an immense flood, again coming from probably Wyoming, Colorado, and places beyond, just enormous, the flood. The, it first of all deposits the rock, and then it comes through, maybe in a little bit later stage, uh, and carves out all of this, this rock, leaving these very uh, 
sharply defined uh, canyons that we see here. Whereas uniformitarians says, no, this river over millions of years wandered back and back and forth through this whole region and gradually carved out the canyon, little by little, like just like we see it happening right now. That's the key point in uniformitarian, uniformitarian thought. The processes that we see happening now, that's the what formed all the ancient rocks and ancient canyons. Okay, uh, this, uh, just a quick analysis of this. The, the, these layers, we'll see some more pictures of these in other presentations. Um, these, are, these are very uniform layers that go for hundreds of miles. Okay, rivers don't deposit like that. They make much more complicated uh, deposits. That, uh, that's an unrealistic. Why did they think that? Because the theory, the uniformity theory, requires you not have catastrophe. And so this it had to be done by these rivers. Um, <clears throat> in cutting the canyon, you see these very finely defined, sharply defined uh, canyons here. Again, uh, a river wandering back and forth over millions of years doesn't do that. It, it took a catastrophic process to cut these very clean uh, canyons. And so, uh, right off, it's not a realistic theory. <clears throat> So the decision to accept Lyell was not led by evidence, but by a choice to accept a particular philosophy. And then Darwin, of course, I mentioned this, he read Lyell's book on the Beagle, and I gave him the time um, to develop his theory of evolution. Now, I, I won't, I'm not getting into this part in my talks, but a lot of, a lot of this has changed in recent decades in terms of, of evolution. New scientific understandings is really making Darwin's theory very unrealistic. People who, scientists who don't believe in creation, especially molecular biologists, they say straight out, Darwin's theory cannot work. Um, Darwin, the, the biological theory, I'll just say, it's, it's in serious scientific trouble. But you'll never read that in the, in the, in the books because if you, if you reject creation, what do you have left? Um, <clears throat> Just one comment here. Uh, if I say, well, you give enough time, random mutations can do this. But to ask how long it will take for random mutations to produce a living cell, from what we know now, that's equivalent to asking how long will it take for my Toyota to swim across the Atlantic Ocean? Well, it's just a completely unrealistic question, that's all. So after Lyell, <clears throat> uniformitarianism controlled geology for a, for a century. Um, catastrophist interpretations were not allowed. But trouble was coming. Trouble in, trouble in the form of a very independent thinking, stubborn geologist, J. Harlan Bretz. Now, J. Harlan Bretz was not really his name. He didn't like his name, Harley. And when he was in college student, he made up the name. He invented the name J. Harlan Bretz. That's what he went by the rest of his life. Well, he studied an area in western Washington state called the Channel Scabland from 1922 to about 1952. And everybody else would automatically say this chaotic landscape formed by very gradual processes. Brett's, it was clear to him that the Scabland required a massive catastrophe to carve this out quickly. He saw a flood of water coming down a mile, half a mile deep. That's what it would take to do this. Uh, <clears throat> now he'd present papers and other geologists would make fun of him uh, to come up with their own theories of how it happened slowly and gradually. Uh, in one case, uh, after at a geology meeting was set up to, to talk about this subject. So Brett thought, oh, this is my chance. And he worked on a paper to make a convincing case for his theory. But the whole meeting was a setup to ridicule Brett's which they did very uh, faithfully. So for several decades, this is what happened. Um, finally, some new evidence came, came to be known. And they, at one meeting, again, they were a meeting discussing this process here on the scab land. Um, Brett's presented his paper. Others presented various theories of how it must have happened slowly and gradually. Then one geologist, a, a prominent geologist from the U.S. Geological Survey, um, got up and gave a paper. He gave it kind of an innocuous title, 
but a historian who described this event says his talk just gradually blew away all the opposition to Brett's theory. Um, and they understood what happened. This, an ice dam up in the, in the glaciated areas broke. This tremendous flood of water did indeed come down through, uh, through that area and carved out this very quickly. Okay, so now Bretz was right and Lyell was wrong. Well, not, they didn't accept the, completely the idea that Lyell was wrong, but certainly uh, there were some things wrong with Lyell's understanding. <clears throat> um, and so this led to an understanding that is called neocatastrophism. It's, uh, it's now recognized that, could do, yes, catastrophes have happened, they do happen, happen. But don't think about Noah's flood. No, that's not, not allowed. But random catastrophes happening occasionally over the you know, long ages between them. Uh, they're unusual, but they do occur. Radiometric dating is accepted as true. There are no global scale catastrophes. Ancient geologic processes occur by the same things we observe today. Rivers, streams, flash floods, ocean currents, winds. So uniformitarian thinking is not supported by evidence, still, by the choice to reject the biblical view and accept the alternative. And so um, they accepted Bretz's theory, but they didn't go far enough. They still stopped, they still accepted all these things as being true. So <clears throat> some of us have been using a different approach in studying geology. Uh, we don't accept uniformitarianism. Um, uh, we use a biblical time frame with, with two primary features, a short time frame, a few thousand years, creation followed by a global catastrophe. So kind of two pillars in this understanding, time, catastrophe. And this approach has repeatedly led to geology research with insights missed by others. And I'm going to talk more specifically about this in another talk. But the fact that we understand that the Bible is true opens our eyes and opens our minds to see things we would not otherwise have recognized. And I'll talk this in, in detail later with the other talk. Um, there's a kind of an instructive episode that happened in the 18th century. Um, there was, there was, it was understood that in England there was a, an area of very chaotic rock deposits spread over, over the, a big area. And this was interpreted as a result of Noah's flood. So these geologists were using the Bible to help them to understand the rocks. This must have been Noah's flood. Well, then after more research and a long debate, it was finally decided that this uh, rock debris was from Pleistocene Ice Age, not the flood. Okay, now this, is, this caused a, a, a crisis for these biblical geologists because they used the Bible to help them to see this must have been Noah's flood. But now the evidence said, no, it wasn't Noah's flood. It was something else. And so a number of these geologists kind of got discouraged at, at using the Bible, and they kind of gave up using the Bible to explain geology. But why was this confusion? Before glaciation was understood, the only geologic process known that could cause such chaotic deposits was Noah's flood. Okay, so this is why they use that interpretation. They interpret this as Noah's flood. Um, <clears throat> but at this time, parts of geologic theory were still in their infancy. There was not enough information to, to understand how to interpret these processes. How do you put together flood geology, uh, the Ice Age, and these other factors? The, the understanding of those things was still long in the future. And so this is why the, the confusion. Um, they didn't know how to interpret those processes. It was too early to try to, to the, for the Bible to give them a correct understanding. Now we have a lot more information. We're in a very different position to try to use this process of using the Bible to understand geology. And I will show you in another talk that I have, this does work. It works very well. Okay, my conclusion. Cultural change from confidence in scripture to supreme confidence in science. This resulted from choices, not from better evidence. Yes, yeah, sir, we got a lot more evidence, but the evidence really did not demonstrate 
what they were concluding. This was from personal choices to leave the Bible aside. And they thought the evidence was on their side. But now looking back, we can see that, that the philosophical shift, we can see what that has done to us and why it came about. Um, and now in, in recent decades, especially evolution and long ages geology are facing increasing challenges. They're not really supported by evidence. And we'll talk more about this as we go along here in this conference. Thank you.